the warning was clear. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Prophesied in scripture, God's judgment is near. A global economic crisis, a conquering power, bloodshed, famine, and disease. A wave of destruction unleashed on our planet. The epic battle of darkness versus light. The world will end, but when? Armageddon's Dawn, a study of the end times with Pastor Jim Scudder Jr. You might think that intro is over hyping it. Let me tell you something. It's impossible to over hype what's coming upon this planet. I'm telling you, this world is in for the worst time that it has ever known. Uh, we just had, again, more earthquakes. And we in Illinois are on a fault line. I remember a few years ago waking up and I thought that I felt the house shake. Now this happens frequently to me because I have dreams and nightmares and it's always about the house caving in. But I think this one time it actually might have been. Because uh, the next day I heard on the news that there was an earthquake and there were just earthquakes in California and it just really rattles you. Especially now with all these cell phone videos and, you know, people are just really rattled. But that's nothing compared to what is coming upon this planet. It is going to be horrendous. And how do we know that? Because the Bible speaks very clearly of it. You say, well, how do we know the Bible's predictions are going to come true? That's a valid question. Here's a really easy way to understand it. There's about two-thirds of the Bible prophecies that have already come to pass. Of those many, many prophecies, they all came true exactly as predicted. Therefore... It gives me great confidence that the third of the prophecies yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. Are you with me? That just seems to make sense to me. Uh, plus, Jesus, the one who came and lived a perfect life and died and rose again, said that this book is true. So we look to the book and we're in the last book of the Bible. Do you remember the layout of this book? The first three chapters were dealing with the first chapter of Jesus, the second two of the church, and then all of a sudden the church is gone. And then we open up to this incredible throne room scene. We're turning the chapter today to chapter five, but we're still in that same theme, that same scene of the throne room. So chapters four and five take together as one. It's a continuation of of chapter four. Have you ever heard someone say that there will be a day when the lion and the lamb will lay down together? I've got a picture for you. This picture seems very unlikely. If you wanted to draw the balloon of what they're thinking, you know, we could come up with all sorts of really great captions here. Uh, you know the lion uh, today is thinking, Delicious, you know, <laughs> wholesome, low fat, organic, you know, chops, whatever. And the lamb is thinking, I am in big trouble, big trouble. But the Bible predicts a day in which the lion and the lamb will lay down together in peace. Unlikely, crazy. This, this is a crazy thought that this could someday actually happen. You know, some author of a magazine article wrote that throughout the history of the world, of all of our written history, there's been over 8,000 peace treaties signed and broken. That author calculated that 8% of the time in the history of the world, we've actually had world peace. 8%. That leaves 92% of the time in the history of the world that we have not had 
world peace. We're not doing very well with this idea of peace. But the Bible predicts there is a day which we will see something like this. Now, do you know that the Bible actually does not say the lion and the lamb will lay down together? Well, where do we get this idea? Well, let's look at Isaiah this morning, Isaiah chapter 11, and this is a prediction of a time coming in the future when the world will be at peace. In verse six, it talks about the wolf will dwell with the lamb. So that's the actual quote, but it doesn't look quite as ominous, a wolf laying with a lamb, although just as dangerous for the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the baby lamb, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. So that's where we get the concept, but I think it's a biblical concept of a lion and a lamb laying down together. And you know Uh, The first few nights, the lamb isn't going to be getting a lot of sleep. But this is is what the Bible predicts is coming. And so what we're going to do today is, is look at how is it, how is it possible in this world of violence, in the world where we, we have all these shootings, right, in Chicago, and it's violent, it's horrible, but we get more incensed and upset that somebody spray graffiti on a sculpture. I don't like graffiti, I think it's, it's horrible. I don't like it anywhere. But we got really mad in Chicago when some people tagged the bean. The bean, and it's kind of an interesting sculpture. It's stainless steel, they call it cloud gate. But um, man, I mean, everybody was upset. Our mayor was upset and just incensed that people would do this, why aren't we incensed like that with things that really are horrible? Well, I tell you, it bothers me when we have this double standard. When will there be a day when we'll actually have true peace? When we won't have weapons pointed at each other, weapons of our words or actual weapons. There is a day, the Bible predicts it, and we're going to see it eventually in this world, when true world peace will come, it won't come until a series of judgments come upon this earth to end the rebellion against God, to end sin, and those judgments won't happen until one is found who is worthy to open the title deed of the world. And that's what we're getting into in Revelation chapter five. Let's go to the prophecy chart before we start reading our text today. And here in the prophecy chart, again, we have the rapture of the church. I believe that happened at the end of Revelation chapter three, because in Revelation chapter four, no more mention of the church. The rapture of the church is written about in several other places in the scripture. The church age ends. And then we have a signing of a seven-year peace treaty by one the Bible describes as the Antichrist. This will seem like the answer. Someone has finally achieved peace in the Middle East. Well, guess what? It's not real. It's not real. And then we have this, these judgments, the seal judgment, the trumpet judgment, the bowl judgment. All of them are tied in with a scroll that we're gonna read about today that has seven seals. Each of those seals is a judgment of God. The seventh seal opens up the trumpet judgments and the seventh trumpet judgment opens up the vile or the bowl judgment. So we're gonna see these unfolding in Revelation chapter six on. These judgments of God, we call this the tribulation period. Then we come to, after all of these things conclude, Christ returns We have this 1,000 years where peace and righteousness will reign on this planet. So that's what this chapter is going to picture, it's going to point to as we study Revelation chapter five. Now remember the throne room scene that this is transitioning to. From chapter four, we read about the scene in heaven with the 24 elders sitting there, the throne of God the Father, bright, translucent, a a, a full circle rainbow, the colors of gems, the the seven spirits of God or the sevenfold manifestation of the spirit of God 
as fire, the four creatures that are bringing worship, representing all of creation. This incredible scene that mirrors the tabernacle and the temple. So this is what we're coming from. This is still the scene that we're in as we go now to Revelation chapter five. And I saw in the right hand of him, now remember who's on the throne, this is God the Father. In his right hand that sat on the throne a book. This is a Greek word, biblios. Biblios can mean a book, like we have books. They call these codex. When you take the pages and you bind them and we can open them, it's a lot easier than the way they used to do it which was scrolls. I like scrolls, scrolls are kinda cool. Some of you don't even have books anymore. You read everything on a device. There's a problem with that. You don't hear pages turning. You don't smell the musty smell of pages. You say, are you really that old fashioned? I guess I am. I mean, I have tablets and computers and I do most of my study on computers because I can carry all my books. I have a library of thousands of books. These are big commentaries and they can all fit on a small computer. I could take it anywhere in the world. I love that, but I still love the idea of a book, and I probably would have rather use a scroll, right? But this is likely a scroll, so when we read this, let's think about this scroll with seven seals. And it says, back to verse one of Revelation chapter five, within and on the backside, it was written. In other words, this thing was full. There, were, there was no more room to write anything else on this document. This was full of writing. Let me stop there for just one second, and I'm gonna bring your attention over to Psalm 139, and then we'll come back to Revelation 5. The Bible speaks of God recording things. God is recording things and he's accurate, and he's not missing anything. How many of you like to keep a journal, or you know, some sort of like a, 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 a history of, of events? I'm really bad at that. I, I just like to live in the moment, right? And I let my wife tell me uh, you know, how many times I've been to Israel, or how many people I've baptized. I just don't do that very well, but some of you do. But I don't care how meticulous you are at writing stuff down, you're missing things, you're missing a lot. God doesn't miss anything. And in Psalm 139, it tells us in verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance. This is the psalmist telling us that God is recording our lives. Everything that we've done, everything that we thought is recorded, and this actually happens before we were born. This is incredible that God knew our life. We're not saying that God has caused everything in our life to happen because he has given us the ability to choose what to do, but he knows what our choices will be ahead of time. And this is all recorded, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Even before we existed, there's a book about you. I wonder what that book is going to say. Well, I hope that you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope, and that means the last chapter is a victorious chapter. How many of you like to turn to the last chapter of a book? You like to read the end first. I do too. What I sometimes do is I just read the, the back cover, and then I write the book report when I was in school. It actually works. Somehow I made it. Back to Revelation chapter 5. And this is not that book. This is, uh, uh, I believe, the title deed to the world. This scroll, this biblios, this, this document in the right hand of Almighty God. It's full. There's nothing else to be added. All we need now is someone to be able to open it. It's sealed with seven seals. Remember the word, the number seven is very important in scripture. 
It's not an accident that this has seven seals. It's the number of completion. We're going to see it throughout Revelation. And I saw, verse 2, a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. You can only let your imagination picture a strong angel. You know, we usually think of someone that's muscular and, and uh, toned, right? Strong. I can't even imagine what this must have looked like, but John saw it with his eyes. And I'm hoping that as we go through Revelation, you're, you're using all of your senses. You'll be able to, to see things and feel things and maybe even smell things because some of these judgments involve the, the wrath of God and, and fire and brimstone. People accuse preachers that are old-fashioned of uh, preaching fire and brimstone. Well, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So I hope you can smell even some of these judgments that are coming upon the earth. A strong angel proclaimed with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book? Who is worthy to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Man, this is terrible. This is a significant document. This document needs to be opened. Is there ever going to be the end to the violence and, and, and the, the sin in this world? Will it ever come to an end? It will not unless this document can be opened. Is there anyone worthy? And they looked everywhere, and they didn't find anyone worthy. And this did something to John, the apostle that was in exile in the island of Patmos. And this did something to him, for it says in verse 4, I wept much. And you say, men don't cry. Yes, we do. We don't cry a lot, but God made men with the ability and the necessity to cry. And this is something we ought to weep about. Because if there is no one that can open this, we have no hope, there's no future. It is bleak, it is something we should all weep about. And he wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. What a sad, depressing, seen in heaven. Do you know that in ancient times, when someone wrote out their will, they would seal that scroll with seven seals. And to open that will, you had to have at least four of the seven people that were witnesses that this is a legitimate document. And if you didn't find those witnesses that could open their seal, then the document would not be accepted. And here we have a seven-sealed title deed to this world. Each one, as it's opened, will begin to pour upon the world the wrath that the world deserves. All of these things coming to a conclusion at the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back. Sin is finally put down. Rebellion is finally put down. The curse of sin is finally put away. Think about that. Think about that. The, the glories of eternity once sin and rebellion is dealt with. And think about it in our own lives. You say, well, I'm not that bad, but we are. We are. We don't respond the way we should to our wives or to our children or to our, our friends all the time. And, and we are all fallen and there's got to be a solution. But if no one can open this book, then there is no future. Oh, I hope someone is found. I hope that we mourn that, that all through the earth no one has been found to this point. Who is worthy? Who can establish justice and righteousness on this earth? The Democrats? The Republicans? President Obama? President Trump? I know, 
the United Nations. Who is worthy? Stand aside, Adam, for you have blown it and you are not worthy to open this book. Stand aside, children of Adam, for you are not worthy to open this book. There's no one that is found worthy to establish justice and righteousness on this earth. Oh, the weight of this. The one that can rule must also be one that has redeemed. The sovereign must be also a savior. Only one equal to God can open this book. Romans 8.22 tells us that the creation is groaning and travailing in pain until now. Even the creation is mourning the fact that we need a righteous ruler. And no one was found. And then we get to Revelation 5, verse 5. And this is awesome. One of the elders saith unto me, this is to John, weep not. Oh, those are wonderful words. When you're in anguish and when you're full of tears and someone puts their arm around you and says, it'll be okay. You can stop crying. Why? Because the lamb, verse 5, it says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. In other words, we found someone. We found someone that is worthy, someone that can open this book, and it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion. What is this lion of the tribe of Judah? Well, as we often do when we're going through the Bible, we're in the last book of the Bible, we need to go back to the first book of the Bible. You see how the whole Bible is unified? It, you can't just separate it. You, you can't say Genesis is hyperbole. Genesis is history. So when we go back to Genesis chapter 49, what do we find out about the lion of the tribe of Judah? Look at verse 9. This is Jacob, or Israel, as his name had been changed to. Very old, well over 100 years old. He is talking to his 12 sons that had gathered around him as he's about to die. And he speaks this prophecy of one of his sons, Judah. He says this, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. What is the scepter? It is the rod of authority that a king holds. When a king holds the scepter, it is a symbol of power and the right to rule. And Judah, a descendant of Judah, will hold that scepter and that will not depart out of Judah. You know what's interesting? The first king of Israel was of Benjamin. That was Saul. And then God told Samuel to choose the youngest son of Jesse, who was David, who was a descendant of Judah. So we have this scepter not departing from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until, now this is really interesting, Shiloh. Now you know that our film team, my wife and I, had just been to Israel and we digged at a place called Shiloh. And that's where worship was centered in the early history of Israel. And eventually that transferred over to Jerusalem. And that is when a descendant of David 
Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. But this is not what this Shiloh is. Obviously, it's the same English word, but this is a mysterious word, and it's hard for commentators to come up to a conclusion of the meaning of this, but Jews and Christians agree that this word Shiloh is in reference to the Messiah. This is a messianic prediction. That, in other words, someone has said that the word Shiloh means to whom the scepter is given. So this Messiah, this future promised Messiah that the Old Testament is speaking of over and over and over again is going to come from Judah. And we know also from Jesse and from David. The scepter won't depart from Shiloh when he comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The lion. And if you'll remember when we talked about the camps of Israel around the tabernacle before they got into the land of Israel, the largest tribe was Judah. And his banner was of a lion. A lion. Why is, we believe, Jesus referred to as a lion? The lion, everyone recognizes, is the king. But why? The lion isn't the biggest animal. He's actually not the smartest animal, not the fastest animal, not the most beautiful animal, not the tallest animal. Why is the lion so feared? Whenever the lion shows up, all the animals flee. Why? Because the lion believes he has the right to rule. That is why the lion is so fierce be, and so feared in the jungles. The lion is king because of who he is. Now let's refer to Jesus as the lion. The Lord Jesus has the right to rule because he has fulfilled all of these predictions. And he's the only one that can open this book. Let's go back to Revelation chapter five, verse six. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, here he is, stood a lamb. A lamb? Wait a second. We were just told that the lion of the tribe of Judah is gonna be the one that can open this book. And now we have a lamb? A lamb? As it had been slain? A lamb, that's, a lamb that still has the marks and maybe the, the blood stains of being killed? You, you cannot get as opposite of a lion as a lamb. I mean, wouldn't we all say the lamb is the meekest, the weakest, the cutest animal? Think about the pageant that happens right here on this stage every Christmas. The lamb steals the show. Beautiful, cute, white, innocent. It has that bleat. <laughs> and every time that bleat happens, the whole audience chuckles and, and laughs and the kids say, oh. Now I know the camel really steals the show, but what steals the heart is that little lamb. That little lamb, so innocent. You cannot have a different contrast, can you? A lion and a lamb. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is both. Now this is incredible. This lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God set forth into all the earth. What in the world? A lamb that has seven horns? Well, what does a horn represent? A horn is symbolic of power. And the Bible says that Jesus is God. So therefore, he would be all powerful. He has complete power. He is omnipotent. And the seven eyes, well, the seven eyes are symbolic of complete knowledge. And Jesus is omniscient. 
So this lamb seems weak and meek and helpless, but because he came to be a sacrifice, he has complete power and complete knowledge, and he can be the lion because he came as a lamb. Exodus 12, verse 3, tells us about the lamb and the Passover, and they were ready to leave Egypt, and God told Moses to have each family choose a lamb, a cute, innocent lamb, and take it and kill it and put the blood over the doorpost of the house. And everyone within that house was saved as the angel of death swept through Egypt. And so Jesus, if he's the lamb, so is he the one who came and poured out his blood. And every person that has applied the blood of Christ over their life is saved from the angel of the second death. In other words, you, if you've applied that blood of that lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus, to your life by faith, by trusting in him, you will not face hell. Isn't that an incredible picture? We also find that uh, in Isaiah 53, it predicts that, that the Messiah, and everyone says Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, verse seven, yet he opened not his mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Most people thought, and, and Jewish people thought, that the Messiah was gonna come as the lion and tear up the enemies of Israel and set up his kingdom. But they missed this. They missed that first he was gonna come as a lamb, and by coming as a sacrifice, by coming as a redeemer, he would therefore be qualified to be the ruler to be the lion. First time he came as a lamb. You know, they say march in like a lion or in like a lamb, out like a lion. Well, Jesus came in like a lamb and he will go out like a lion. And this is incredible. John the Baptist proclaimed when he saw Jesus after he met the Lord, the next day he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Do you know Revelation says that Jesus is the Lamb 27 times? The, the, the Revelation doesn't speak as much about Jesus being the Lion, although he is. The emphasis of scripture is Jesus coming as a sacrifice. This is incredible. The God of all glory, the God that has all power, the God that has all knowledge came to die for me? This is mind-blowing. This is life-changing stuff. The lamb pictures the first coming. The lion pictures the second coming. The lamb is a picture of meekness. The lion is a picture of majesty. The lamb is the savior. The lion is the sovereign. The lamb is the one that was judged. The lion is the judge. The lamb is grace. The lion is government. One and the same in Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb that was slain. Who is worthy? Who can open up this title deed to the world, Revelation 5, 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You know, a lot of denominations have went through their songs and they took the blood out because they said it was offensive. It was gory. 
Well, you can't have that hymnal in heaven then, because this song contains the blood of the Lamb. How foolish are we sometimes? It is so beautiful, it is so wonderful, this new song that is sung in heaven. I love that it also talks about all kindreds, all tongues, all people, and all nations. You cannot get as opposite to English as some of the Asian languages. When I travel, I can get by, kind of, as long as it's Latin letters. I can see sometimes the word, and I can recognize the word, and I can limp through it. But once you go to a country that has characters that aren't Latin letters, it's over. I have no idea what is going on. And you know what? Who, invi- who invented languages? Who invented all of this? Of course, it is God. The Bible speaks of it in Genesis, the Tower of Babel, the invention of these languages. And all the people of all the world, the blood was shed for all of them. Some people have studied Chinese, and they've noticed something. They've noticed certain words in Chinese, certain characters have their roots in the book of Genesis. Now this seems odd at first until you think about how this could be. You have all people, not that long between Babel was the flood and the ark, so you have all people coming from Noah and his sons, repopulating the earth, not spreading out like God says. You have this tower of Babel, We're gonna build our empire. We're gonna reach up to God. We don't need God. And God says, yes, you do, and change the languages. You lean over to ask the guy for a hammer, and you're speaking just some gibberish. And it just was confusion, babble, right? And then everyone finally dispersed as God said. And those that settled in the region of China had this knowledge, they had the, the, the basis And there are a lot of words that are combined that go back to the story in Genesis. And one that I want to bring to you today as we close is really incredible. The character that you see right here behind me is the character for Lamb. Now what's amazing about this? Well, look at the next one. This is the Chinese character for myself or me. So if I wanted to say me or myself, this is the character for that. Now, if you take lamb and me and you put the lamb over me, this forms another word. This word, lamb over me, in Chinese, is righteousness. So if you wanted to say righteousness in Chinese characters, you would write the symbol for lamb over me. This, to me, is incredible. Because that's exactly what Revelation chapter 5 tells us. We had better be afraid of God's judgment, of the roar of the lion. We had better be afraid. And the only safe place to be when God's judgment falls is where God's judgment has already fallen. Where has God's judgment already fallen? On the cross, on the sun, on the lamb. God poured out his anger, his wrath for our sins upon his son, the perfect lamb, innocent, meek, lowly. He could have called 10,000 angels. He's all powerful, the seven horns, but he died alone for you and for me. So if you want to avoid the wrath, the roar of the lion, you had better have found Jesus at the cross. He came to redeem you. He is coming again to be the ruler. 
Jesus came as a lamb so that you and I don't have to fear him as a lion. And when he roars, if you know him, it'll be a roar that will bring confidence to your heart. And you will say, because he's right here, that roar doesn't scare me, but it'll scare all those that are coming against me. Can you imagine that? The power of God. Who is worthy? Who is worthy? They looked all over. Who is worthy? The lion? He is worthy. The lamb? He is worthy. The Lord? He is worthy. So the answer, who is worthy? The lamb, the lion, or the Lord? The answer is yes. Because Jesus is all. He is all in one. And it is because of him that I don't have to fear the judgments that are coming as the scroll is opened one seal at a time. Do you know him? Have you received by faith the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible makes it very simple for you. He is the lamb. He said in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Perish is this idea of the second death, which is eternal hell. Everlasting life is in heaven with God forever. And we're gonna go more into that and what it's gonna be like in heaven. And, and some people say, well, I don't wanna be bored. You will not be bored in heaven, I'll promise you that. The most exciting aspects of your life today, it'll be far greater than that. No, heaven is incredible. To be there with the line of the tribe of Judah, you have to have the lamb over you. In other words, the blood above the doorpost of your life. How do you do that? It says right here, believe. Whosoever believeth in him. So how do you put that blood of the lamb of God above your life? All you do is believe. You trust in Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God that paid the price for your sin. You believe in him, the Bible says you will not perish but have everlasting life. Let's look at this verse, these verses. For by grace are you saved through faith. You know, that's the same word as believe. It's the same word in the Greek. One's a verb, one's a noun. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So many people are trying to earn eternal life when it's not for sale. You can't buy it. Why? Because you don't have enough money. We're all broke. It, 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 it's so valuable. There's no amount of money or work we could do for it. So how can we be saved? It's through faith, not of ourselves. It's when we say, I, I can't do it. I put my trust in Jesus. I put that blood over the doorpost of my life. Then I receive the gift of God, that angel, that angel of death, of second death, will pass over me if the lamb is over you. In other words, if you have the righteousness of Jesus applied to your life. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. This is something that is free. It's not of us. It's all of Jesus. Have you ever in your life put your trust in him? Say, this really makes sense. I'm starting to understand it. I'm not asking you to understand the whole Bible. I'm just asking you to see from Scripture what we said today. Have you received the Lamb of God. And if you do that, you will not fear the lion of the tribe of Judah. And his roar is great, and he is mighty. He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful. He will judge you thoroughly. But if you have the blood of Christ, you have the righteousness of Christ. If you have the righteousness of Christ, there is no wrath upon your life. Would you please bow as we conclude in prayer with your heads bowed in a, in a silent moment before God with your eyes closed. I want this to be a moment that you could speak to God directly. And if you are here and you don't remember a time when you have said, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, but right now I put my trust in Jesus, do it right now. I'm not embarrassing anybody. 
This is between you and the Lord. But make that decision. Don't delay. Don't wait. When will this wrath come? We don't know. It could be soon. But we also don't know if we were to, to walk out of here and have a heart attack or, or be hit in a, in a car accident. We don't know. That's why you don't wait. You're, you're, God is offering eternal life. Don't hesitate to receive that. How? By faith. Trust Jesus as your Savior. The Lamb that died, he poured out his blood for your sins. He still will have the scars uh, in heaven. The scars on his hands and feet. The scars on his side. The only blemish in eternity because it will show you throughout all eternity how much he loves you. Don't reject that love. Receive by faith the Lord Jesus. If you've done that today, can I pray for you with heads bowed and eyes closed? If you've made that decision today to put your trust in Jesus Christ, hold up your hand right now. When you do that, I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Hold it up right now. Say, Pastor Scudder, today I've put my trust in Jesus Christ. I've seen a couple. Are there any others today? Between you and the Lord, by, by, by raising your hand, I can pray for you and encourage you in your life with Christ. Anyone else today? Let me talk to those of you that have received Jesus Christ as your Savior he already paid for your sins and you've accepted that and you have the lamb over you right now. Thank him for that. Praise him for that. In your heart say, you are worthy to receive all glory and honor and dominion and power. You are worthy to open the title deed of this world you are worthy to put an end to sin. And may I serve you because you are worthy. Lord, we're so thankful today that we've been able to go through your word and just understand the book of Revelation just by studying it and, and asking you for help with these things, Lord. But we see something incredible, something awesome. We thank you for what is coming in the future. We thank you that we don't have to fear the lion because we've trusted in the lamb. Lord, help us to always love you and, and serve you because of what you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.